Greetings. My name is Kevin Reddick, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. Here we discuss topics and issues to engage in for greater enlightenment and understanding. I'm very passionate about discussing these issues, and so I do so from a Christian biblical perspective. I believe that by sharing our experiences and insights, we can learn from one another and grow in our faith and understanding of God's word. Today's conversation addresses journeying through the dimensions and levels of faith. So jump in the car and let's ride. As Christians, we are all on a journey of faith. And this journey is filled with different challenges and obstacles that we must overcome. And to overcome them, we need to obtain different dimensions and levels of faith. When I use the term dimension, I'm referring to the nature, the quality, character, and class of a thing, in this case, faith. When I use the term level, I'm referring to doing things better than average, uh, ability uh, uh, more advanced or more successful than before. Faith is a powerful force that can move mountains and break down barriers. It is the foundation of our relationship with God and the driving force behind our actions. But what many of us fail to realize is that faith is not a one size fit all concept. The degree of faith required to overcome a certain challenge in your life may be different from the dimension or level of faith needed for my life facing a similar challenge. Scripture points out various dimensions of faith. And since eight is the number of new beginnings, I'll list eight of them here. Number one, Romans 4 and 19 references weak faith. The word means to be feeble and without strength, powerless, needy, or sick. Second, Matthew 16 and 8, it refers to little faith trusting too little. And this is when we are really struggling with doubt. Number three, we find in 2 Corinthians 10 and 15, referring to increasing faith. This represents a dimension of faith where growth, growth excuse me, is evident. Number four, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 3, it refers to exceedingly growing faith. Paul commended the Thessalonians for their growing faith. He used the word in the Greek language that means to grow beyond measure. And the Bible tells us that God has given each of us a measure of faith. He expects that we mature from that measure to greater measure of faith, such as rich faith. James chapter 2 verse 5 uh, uh, comments on rich faith referring to abounding in resources or abundantly supplied or abounding in virtues and possessions. This dimension of faith abounds in the wealth of the kingdom of God. Romans 4 and 20 refers to strong faith. Abraham, known as the father of faith, had this kind of faith. The word means to be endued with strength and this level of faith has endurance. In Luke chapter 7, verse 9, and Matthew chapter 8, verses 10, it records great faith. Two people in scripture were uh, commended for great faith. One was a Roman centurion, and the other was a Syrophoenician woman. They both impressed Jesus with their level of faith on behalf of another. Now, there are two dimensions of great faith. The first refers to great quantity. The second is greatness in intensity, stature, authority, and power. Number eight, we find in James chapter two, verse 22, referring to perfect faith. The apostle James described perfect faith as belonging to one who is a doer of the word and exercises faith to change. It means to complete something or to carry through thoroughly, to bring to an end, to accomplish and fulfill. 
Like it's not enough to just confess faith in our lives. The definitive test is the doing and performing of it, demonstrating faith in real life situations. This is faith that is tested, perfected, and matured. The point is that our, our faith should, should never remain static. It should be moving, flowing from weak to perfected faith. Our desire must be to enter into a new dimension of faith. If we have weak faith, we must desire that it become strong. For strong faith, we must be strong in our reading and studying of God's word, strong in prayer and worship. All of these are only increased in our lives by an act of our will. We must desire it. We must want it. We must seek after it. And desire often produces action. The fact is, faith is an action. James 4 and 7 instructs us, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is how our shield of faith, when used properly, overcomes the enemy's fiery darts. We submit our will and choose to worship God and obey him. Long before uh, 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 these dimensions were revealed to us uh, uh, and even accessible to us, there are levels that we are to obtain in order to advance in dimensions. The first level of faith is known as simple faith, which is the starting point for all believers. Simple faith is the belief in God and his promises. It is the unshakable trust that God is in control. It is the faith that helps us take that, take that first step towards building a relationship with God and surrendering our lives to him. The second level of faith is tested faith. This is when our faith is put to the test through trials and tribulations and hardships. We may face situations that seem impossible to overcome. It is these enduring times that our faith is strengthened. In a sense, untested faith has no proven worth and its quality remains unknown. A tested faith is a faith that will stand. It is how faith is transferred from the head to actions that build relationships. Remember, faith is not doing something for God. Faith is your relationship with God. The third level of faith is growing faith. As we continue to face challenges and come out stronger on the other side, our faith grows. It becomes deeper and more rooted in our hearts. Growing faith helps us in developing a stronger relationship and connection with God, trusting in Him and His Word, and acting in accordance with His will. Growing faith pushes us to act on our faith, taking risks, speaking out for justice, and pursuing our calling are all acts of faith that can help us grow. The final level of faith is mature faith. This is the highest level of faith, and it, it is reserved for those who have been on a long and demanding journey. Mature faith is characterized by uh, unwavering trust in God, regardless of the circumstance. In the book of Luke, we are introduced to a woman whose life is a lesson in journeying through the various dimensions and levels of faith. We find her in the book of Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 43 to verse 48. And it reads, But as he went, the multitudes thronged him, referring to Jesus. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. 
Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she, be she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched them and how she was healed immediately. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. For 12 years, this woman placed her faith in doctors to no avail. As her journey started, her faith was strong in the doctors she visited. But as her medical bills piled up and her vision for a cure became harder to see, her hopes and expectations went down. For some, this could be considered a bad thing. However, her emotional, mental, and psychological state was now the perfect environment for faith in, in, in God and positive faith movement in her life. In time, this woman's faith will transfer from doctors to Jesus. Regarding the biblical teaching that faith without works is dead, I find this woman's encounter with Jesus is the perfect illustration of that lesson. She could have stayed home and rested in her faith. She could have stayed home and wallowed in her misery. But she decided to put herself at great risk by leaving the house in her condition and putting her faith into action. This was the testing of her faith. When she arrived where Jesus was, I could see her faith growing as she pressed through the crowd to get to Jesus. At this point, her faith encouraged her to push past individuals who may have recognized her as, quote, the woman with the issue. You know how quickly gossip travels when you're dealing with a known issue. <laughs> According to Jewish customs at the time, she was guilty of the violation of coming out in public during her menstrual cycle. Such an act demanded her public stoning. I'm sure she was aware of the danger she was putting herself in. Applied faith is simply defined as the conscious decision to ignore intellectual possessing of a situation while focusing on a desired outcome. Christians are called to have a growing faith, built up by prayer, reading and studying of the word, the encouragement of others, and testing. Our faith should not be stagnant, but applied and active. This woman approached Jesus and touched the border or hem of his garment. This border was warned by uh, Jewish people to remind them of God's laws, according to Numbers 15, 37, and 40. This woman had been hemorrhaging for years, which means she had been a, in a perpetual state of uncleansliness, according to Jewish law. And you find this in Leviticus 15, 25, Ezekiel 36, 17. This is why she came up behind him to contact his garment and not touch his person. She has been shut out from all religious life and social outcasts she had become. In despair over her loneliness and condition, she hoped that an underground approach, a, a secret touching of Jesus would change her faith. Her solution worked, but it also brings her more than she bargained for. You see, this act of faith could not remain a secret. A 12 year sickness, which no one else could heal, was instantly healed. In this account, Jesus was returning to Capernaum where a man and a woman who each had heavy burdens to share with Jesus was on, was on a faith journey. The contrast here is interesting, for it shows the variety of people who came to Jesus for help. The man's name is given, Jairus, but this woman remains anonymous. Jairus was a wealthy leading citizen but the woman was a lowly person who spent all her money trying to get healed. Here was a man interceding for his child. 
and a woman hoping to get help for herself. And both came to the feet of Jesus. Jairus had been blessed with 12 years of joy with his daughter, and now he might lose it. While the woman had experienced 12 years of misery because of her affliction, and she was hoping to lose it with the help of Jesus. 12 is an important number in the lives of these two individuals. The number 12 is found 187 times in the Bible. Through its use alone, it would seem significant. The places we find it in the Old and the New Testament assert its importance and hence at its meaning. Here are 12 instances when the number 12 is used in scripture. For example, we have Jacob had 12 sons. These 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses sent out 12 spies. Elijah built an altar of 12 stones when he called fire down from heaven. 12 minor prophets are in the Bible. God specified that 12 uh, uh, cakes of bread be placed weekly in the temple. Jesus' first words are recorded at the age 12 when Mary and Joseph found him in his, quote, father's house. Jesus had 12 disciples. When Jesus fed the 5,000, 12 baskets were filled with leftovers. When Peter cut off the soldier's ear defending Jesus, Jesus rebuked him saying he had the power to call down 12 legions of angels. The New Jerusalem had 12 gates and 12 foundations recorded in Revelations 21 and 12 and the tree of life will bear 12 fruit crops 12 times a year, according to Revelation 22. One of the symbolisms of the number 12 is foundation. Could it be that for 12 years, God was allowing the building of the foundation on which uh, these two individuals' faith would have to stand on at this particular moment in their lives? Jesus knew that he had been touched, but he didn't know by whom. Why did it matter? Couldn't Jesus have let this woman go her way? The truth is, it wasn't that Jesus didn't know who touched him. He wanted her to step forward and identify herself. Jesus wanted to teach her that his cloak did not contain some magical properties, but that her faith in him had healed her. It was not simply a woman's touching of Jesus' garment that healed her, for others pressed against Jesus as well. It was the faith that caused her to touch Jesus that brought healing. Yet something more important happened than the uh, sensation of her bleeding stopping. The experience, physical healing, uh, she experienced was great but there was even more, even greater than she bargained for. See, if Jesus' concern for her did not inv uh, only involve physical healing only, that would have really shortchanged this miraculous account. Luke reported that Jesus sought out this woman because something greater than physical healing was taking place. Through faith, the woman also received spiritual healing. He may also have wanted to teach the crowds a lesson. You know, Jesus was always teaching because he's a master teacher. According to Jewish law, a man who touched a ministering woman became ceremonially unclean, according to Leviticus 15, 19 through 28. And this was true whether her bleeding was normal or, as in this woman's case, the result of illness. To protect themselves from such defilement, Jewish men carefully avoided touching, speaking, or even looking at such women. By contrast, Jesus proclaimed to hundreds of people that this, quote, unclean woman had touched him, and then he healed her. 
In Jesus' mind, this suffering woman was not to be overlooked. As God's creation, she deserved attention and respect. In addition, Jesus knew that for this woman to be able to return to normal social relations and worship, her cure would need to be known publicly. She came for healing and received it, but she also received a relationship and peace with God himself because of her faith. Not only did the woman have faith, but she also placed her faith in the right person this time. Not in the doctors, but in Jesus. Jesus responded to her beginning with the word daughter. By the affectionate term daughter, Jesus immediately reassured the woman and alleviated her fears. Fears. He called her daughter, which suggests that she was now in the family. She was a citizen of the kingdom of God. The, it, the, the, the scripture records, he said, you have been made whole. That term is a translation which really means to be saved. <laughs> so she had a healed body and a saved soul. And she went out in peace, all because of her faith journey. More than anything, her faith was in Jesus. And the object of faith, faith was much more important than the quality of faith. She was a testimony to the power of faith and her witness was a rebuke to the multitudes. So you can be a part of the crowd and never get any blessing from being near Jesus. <laughs> it is one thing to, to press him as, as, as the multitudes did in this account, but it's another thing to touch him by faith as this woman did. We may not have strong faith, but we do have a strong Savior. And he responds even to a touch at the hem of his garment. Today, many people are vaguely familiar with Jesus. They, they, they know about him, but they don't know him. And therefore, nothing in their lives is changed or beggared uh, by this intellectual relationship, this passing acquaintance. It is only faith that increases God's healing power in our relationship with him. Jesus must be more than a curiosity. Reach out to him in faith and, and, and knowing that his mercy will bring healing to your mind, body, soul, and spirit. And more importantly, knowing that this reaching out will increase and strengthen your relationship with him. What say you? Well, I hope you enjoyed the ride today. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation. Otherwise, thank you for spending some of your time with me. Please take a second to like this post, share it with family and friends, and subscribe to this channel. And as always, peace and blessings to you and your household.